this point. <laughs> so um, at this time, I believe we've all waited quite long enough. I'm going to bring Monique up to the stage to introduce Miss Kate Bornstein. Hi. Yeah. And welcome to the banquet. I saw most of you at the front desk, and all complaints about seating need to be directed directly to me because I was in charge of all of that mess out there. So, something went wrong, don't yell at Lexus, just send it straight to my inbox. <laughs> Thank you for all our sponsors this year. You were great when I re responded to my emails when I wanted a list of who was going to be here, blah, blah, blah. Y'all were spectacular. Enough of that. Our speaker tonight, our keynote is uh, Kate Bornstein, and she's probably well known to most people here. But if you don't know who she is, she's a playwright, she's an activist, she's a gender theorist, she's an author, she's a performer, she's an amazing person, human being. And she changed my life. And to In 2000, in 2012, 2002-ish, when I was really coming to grips, but here I am. I found a book, and the book was Gender Outlaw by Kate. And I'm standing in half price books looking at the gender studies books because I'm a cheap girl. <laughs> and um, sorry, Kate. <laughs> and as I look through this thing, there's this byline in the cover, and it says, I am not a man, but I've grown to understand that I am not a woman either. And this was truth. Truth to me. And y'all see me mostly as my glamorous little self, who cries whenever she talks. <laughs> but a lot of you also see me in my boy draft, because I spend a lot of time both ways. I move back and forth, whatever I feel like on the day. And that book gave me permission to do that. <laughs> thinking about this journey and about transition, and it didn't really feel just right, and it was terrifying, and I hadn't even considered some other opportunity or path. And then I figured out why I'd always been so afraid, because it wasn't actually right for me, and I had to do what was right for me, and Kate gave me permission. So, y'all are here, sitting in the seats, but I told you to sit in, because of Kate. Thank you.
I've got stuff I want to talk about, and I need to preface it a little bit first. In 2012, I was diagnosed with lung cancer. Um, in 1996, I'd been diagnosed with leukemia. And because the two cancers act so differently in the body, um, it wasn't easy to find treatment or any kind of chemotherapy that would work on me. And my insurance didn't cover it. In an early, very early crowdsourcing campaign, um, thousands of you came together and raised $100,000. And today, I, I'm cancer-free for a year and a half. I would not be alive if it was not for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. The funny thing, all right, do you know, have you heard of chemo brain? Okay, like with chemotherapy and with old age, it changes how you think. So my mind is completely different right now. I'm going to talk from talking points here, and I hope it all makes sense. A week after I finished chemotherapy and radiation, I was still groggy as all hell. Um, I saw the cover of Time magazine with Laverne Cox, and all of a sudden there was a transgender tipping point. I thought, what the fuck? <laughs> oh, I'm gonna say fuck. I hope that's all right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I thought to myself, really, I, a tipping point? I've been in, in chemotherapy and radiation for close to two years, and I woke up to see that. We, we have our first transgender star, and she's a woman of color. We have a literary face of transgender is Janet Mock, and she's a woman of color. And we have the pop culture face of trans, and that's RuPaul, a person of color. Finally, we've got some dimension to us. All these people of color are breathing new life into transgender, which was well on its way to becoming just another stale, white, mainstream trope. But a transgender tipping point, and that's when I realized the meaning of the word had shifted, had shifted big time when I was too busy getting through my cancer treatments. Brief history of the word. I want to thank you, Kristen. Finally get to meet you. Uh, and I want to talk with you more about this history. This is how I knew it. I, the, what I picked it up from is the, the, the line from Virginia Prince on. Virginia Prince used the word in the 1960s, late 60s. 1959, and then um, she used transgender role in 1969, December of 69. Thank you. Yep. Yep. What, what she, when you, if, all right, anyway, it was early. It was 1959 into the 1960s. Um, back then, it was a brand new concept. Virginia Prince was a cross-dresser who wanted to live full-time as a woman but she didn't want to take hormones, and she didn't want to take, do any surgery. So she was not a transsexual. She was not really a transvestite anymore because she considered herself a woman, but without anything else. And so she came up with transgender, as opposed to transsexual, which involved at that time hormones and surgery. And there was preoperative and postoperative and non-operative. Uh, transvestite, as far as that, there were all kinds, and you were telling me, uh, I know, there was, there, there was a spectrum of participation, or, uh, of lifestyle of transvestite, from full-time to part-time cross-dressers. Um, there was no word for all of us at that point. But in the 1990s, a bunch of us in San Francisco, Seattle, Minneapolis, and New York City, and Houston, we stole her word, and we turned it into a word that meant family. 
transgender. And that meant anyone who was messing around with gender in any way, they were transgender. They were family. And since then, transgender has been that family word. But who among us had actually reached a tipping point? That's what I wanted to know. And these were binary identified, gender binary, male and female only. All right, binary. Uh, because I am a theorist, please allow me this moment. Uh, think of gender as a space. What fills up that space in the binary is just one line down the middle and there's two equal and opposite sides. And you're a man or you're a woman, whether you're male or you're female. As soon as you enter a third into a binary, it breaks completely apart. And in the same space, it's no longer a binary, it's called a dialectic. And inside that dialectic are many binaries and spirals and spectrums. Man and woman, boy and girl, butch and femme, uh, even transgender and cisgender. These are all different binaries that are going on inside the dialectic of gender. But back then, we didn't even talk about binaries. Um, but binary identified trans men and trans women were poised at the top of that tipping point. And that's what transgender has come to mean today outside our little bubble in here. Transgender to the world at large means men and women of trans experience. Men and women of trans experience. <laughs> Everything old is new again. Transgender's right back where Virginia Prince wanted it to be, and I know she'd be really happy to hear it. She gave me hell every time she said, like, stole my word! <laughs> and now someone stole it from me. I need to speak for a moment about my own odyssey at this point. I tried to be a man. I did. I went through life. I did not want to be a freak. And I looked at men, and I was going, how do you? How do you do that, that guy thing? <laughs> guy thing. I'm talking about guys, right? And, and I, I did it, did the guy, yeah, did the guy thing. And it was all pretending. It was all pretending. So I went through what I was told to do. I was a good little thing. And I became a woman. One to the other. That's all I knew. And then all of a sudden, I have to decide, well, all right, how do I do this? You know what I mean? You know what I mean. <laughs> and I could do it, but it felt like a lie. And I finally decided, no, no, I really, I'm not a man. I'm not a woman. And that was a dark night of the soul. And Finally, it's become an area of my great, great, great happiness. In the 1980s, I was calling myself a male-to-female transsexual lesbian. Male-to-female was important to say because there were female-to-males who were getting invisibilized today. We don't see very many female-to-males at this point, at to ends. Lesbian was important to say because we were all presumed to be heterosexual. Post-operative was important to say because back then, the world at large believed genital conversion was a requirement for being real. People back then did ask us about our genitals on television and radio. We were only too happy to tell them. <laughs> you know what they were? All right, let me tell you what they did. Right, they took a knife, they slid it, they cut it open, they pulled this stuff out, sewed it back up, pulled it up inside me, kind of like pulling a sock inside it. <laughs> And we had so much fun talking about our genitals. <laughs> we would just get all the men in the audience usually cross their way. <laughs> I had stopped being a man. I stopped being a woman. I called myself transgender because I was neither. And transgender worked. I wrote my first book, Gender Outlaw, with the subtitle on men, women, and the rest of us. Because we hadn't been talked about that much. I made these points in my book that I'm proud of. Gender is not dependent 
on genitals or hormones. Trans people have a wide range of bodies and body parts. And gender is not dependent on appearance. Some trans people look like men and women. And some trans people look like an amazing blend of both. And gender is fluid. Yes, someone can change their gender once or many times in their lifetimes or many times in a day. Most importantly, I think, is the fact that gender is more than two. And in the eyes of the world, those of us who were operating on this basis, who were starting to live on this basis, we were all freaks. We were all outlaws. Some of us enjoyed being outlaws. I really did. I uh, still do. And some of us hate being outlaws. Don't want to be that. I get people today calling, Kate, I am not a gender outlaw. No problem. <laughs> So in less than 20 years after I wrote Gender Outlaw, transgender reached a tipping point, and some of us were now in-laws. <laughs> we had never been so openly courted by mainstream media. We had never before had any of our trans family had genuine allies in our quest for civil rights. And never ever that I know of in recorded history have there been families welcoming their trans children. Please, yes. You know, the kids today who are growing up, who are deciding and, and navigating their gender starting from the age five or six on, or four or five or six or nine years old on, Yes, they're pioneers, but even more so the pioneers uh, that I want to reach out and thank this evening are their parents and families. So, it was a tipping point. We are here to stay. And all of us were still family, but we are coming to part. We are coming apart at the dividing line of mainstream acceptance and respectability. And I want to read something over here that I saw on the banner. Excuse me. 1979, Charles Law speaking at the National March on Washington, October 14th, 1979. I am afraid that we will find that those gay people who do not come across as being offensively gay, or militantly gay, or obviously gay, or adamantly gay, or admittedly gay, will be the ones to re reap the benefits. And the real sissies and the butch women of this country will still have to live in gay ghettos and not have achieved the true import of this movement. This has not changed one quick. Outlaws and in-laws alike, we are still family, and the new family word is trans, and I like it. The world outside trans does not know how radically different we all are here. I, I know there's over 200 people here, and I'm guessing there's over 100 genders. <laughs> but the world outside this does not know the subtle difference between the outlaws among us and those of us who aren't outlaws, but are simply men and women. But those of us who are trans family, we know who's respectable and who's not, and it's time we heal that division within our own family. Part of the splintering is from outside pressure, sure. Um, the right wing, for decades now, back through the 40s, 30s, and 40s, uh, has been carving up the liberal left like a Thanksgiving turkey and setting us at odds with each other. They're really good with it. That's why a family name is important. We can maintain our individuality, but we come together as family. Part of the splintering is because we are, after all, what's called intersectional. There are different vectors of oppression in, in the culture, uh, race, 
class, age, sexuality, religious beliefs, and so on, and these intersections divide us. We are divided, I, know, I hear you. Yes, you, you're a much more gender diverse uh, trans group than I've seen in many, many a day. And I applaud you for that. But the weapon most commonly used to keep us apart and attack us and divide us is misgendering. Not all misgendering is weaponized. Trans people get misgendered when people can't tell who or what we are. You know, what the hell? I, is that a man or is that a woman? And oh, that, I'm going to be speaking in Chicago on life's great questions uh, in a couple of weeks. And the question I picked is, is that a man or is that a woman? <laughs> and I think where I'm going with this thing is, that's not the important question. I mean, it really is. You know, it, but the important question is, is, why do you need to know? <laughs> do you need, and I, I think, I think the answer is simply, people need to know if they have the right to be attracted to us. <laughs> You know, what, what, if, what if I like that person? What does that make me? I think that's what it's really about. Uh, but cisgender people have been using misgendering as a weapon for, for thousands of years. Cisgender people tell themselves over each other over and over, you're not a real woman because you haven't had a child yet. You're not a real woman because you're not old enough. You're not a real woman because you're too fat. You're not a real woman because you're too tall. Over and over, misgendering has been a weapon in our culture. Since people tell each other over and over, you're not a real man because you're too girly. You're not a real man because you're too puny. Or you don't make enough money. It's bullshit. And since people either cave in to people being mean to them, or they learn to say, fuck you. I don't give a good rat's ass what you think a real man or a real woman is. I know I am. Now the easiest way to misgender trans people is through are through pronouns and bathrooms. And, and sure enough, I mean it's easy. It's 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 a cheap trick. And most of us cave into being people being mean to us. Some of us are willing to say fuck you. I don't care whether you respect my understanding of myself. But, but some of and some of us are learning to say your opinion of my gender has got nothing to do with me. And that's an important one. But the sad news is that because we are such a wide and sprawling family, we're being mean to each other. Uh, we're using the same tool of misgendering. And we're telling people, you're not a real transgender person. We're telling people, oh no, you're not trans enough. This is where I'm going to use my privilege as an elder to make a pronouncement. There is no right way to be transgender. seen a more inclusive gathering of trans people. I mean, what a wild spectrum in this room. You know, it, it's Ken and Barbie meet the Adams family. <laughs> <laughs> So here's the deal, you are trans enough no matter how you identify, no matter how you express your gender. You're a member in good 
withstanding of this impossible family of trans simply by saying you are a member of this family. And if you're a person who loves a trans person, then that makes you family. And you can too. That's how it works. But we're still being mean to each other around one sticking point. And that's called, it's, it's another binary, straight versus queer. Straight and queer are, are ideologies of sex, sexuality and gender. Uh, straight doesn't mean heterosexual anymore. Uh, queer doesn't mean homosexual anymore. Straight means someone who's very conservative about their gender identity, their ideas of gender, their gender expression. And queer is uh, an ideology of gender that's more radical. It's, that's really all it comes down to. So what it, straight is the right wing of sex and gender identity and discussion, and queer is the left wing. So we've got a lot of straight lesbians and gay men who <laughs> want marriage, joint stock certificates, and gay day at Disneyland. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. It's American fucking dream. <laughs> and we've got a lot of queer heterosexuals who might be just kinky into bondage, discipline, whips, and chains. <laughs> straight trans people, all of us in this room, with each other, right this minute. Straight comes down to binary conforming. Queer comes down to some form of non-binary. Before I go any further, I need to say a few words about triggers. I'm going to start with a quote from John Waters, one of my favorite artists, uh, who was addressing the Rhode Island School of Design graduation ceremony this year. And he told them, trigger warning, my whole life has been a trigger warning. There, you've been warned. <laughs> Once again, I have to deal with shifting definitions. Trigger originally meant a sight or a sound or an experience that causes an earlier traumatized person to re-experience the trauma as if it's really happening right this minute again. Triggering is a phenomenon, in that term, a phenomenon of um, PTSD and borderline personality disorder. I live with both of those disorders, so I know that what I'm talking about. But now, trigger is very often used to mean I'm hurt, I'm very offended, or I've been made to feel unsafe. None of these are nice things to experience, but that's about as bad as it gets. It's not a nice thing to experience. I, I said I live with post-traumatic stress disorder and borderline. Uh, my post-traumatic stress is from my 12 years in the Church of Scientology. That's a lot more embarrassing than saying, hi, I'm a tranny. <laughs> yeah, I, I ran, I ran, I ran for my gender stuff right into the arms of hell on fucking hover. <laughs> PTSD as a result of that, I, I live with borderline personality. There's a, a therapy that works for us. It's called dialectic behavioral therapy. If you remember the dialectic with all the different impossible to get along with strategies going on, it gets you to look at world, the world that way. Uh, basically, it's learning how to untrigger yourself. And that's what I did. I learned how to untrigger myself. Pema Chodron is a Buddhist master, and she came up with the word Shempa. It's a, a Tibetan word, I believe. Shempa. Basically, it means the moment you're hooked. 
and you're off to the races. It's like, oh, this is terrible soup. What are you putting in front of me here? What, are you, what, are you, what is your problem? You know, or how dare they let that person in here? And you're off to the races. You're not thinking. You're just gone. It's that right before you're off to the races, it's that moment you're hooked into something bad. And I'm going to ask, give you a tip now. When you get triggered like that, I'm really upset. I don't feel safe. And you say, well, golly, I've been triggered. If you, get, if you can say that, you're 80% of the way to being untriggered. So here we go. It's time to talk about the ongoing war between transgender and trannies. Breathe. <laughs> Step back. Still me. And I'm still talking to you with love and great respect. I am a tranny. Like it or not, it's a valid gender identity embraced by people of all generations. And I want to give you a little history of the word tranny. A lot of people say, oh, no, you're trying to reclaim a hate word. No, 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 no. Tranny was coined and I want to talk with you about this, Kristen. Tranny was coined in uh, Sydney, Australia in the late 60s and early 70s. All the male to female trans folk, none of them could get a job. The ones who were obvious, blatant, flamboyant, none of them could get a job uh, unless it was in drag. And so they had to work together, and that was the transsexuals, and the drag queens, and the transvestites. And they all, me, 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 me. I'm a better person than you because I'm transsexual. No, I'm better than you because I'm a drag queen. Have you seen Priscilla, Queen of the Desert? Yeah. It was like that. And they were family. So they came up with a word to say family, and that, well, that word was trannies. And they kept that no matter how they fought, they could come back and understand themselves as family. They were the radical, queer, trans folk. And they were pretty straight. The, tran the, the, the transsexuals who were working in drag show were pretty straight identified in terms of sexuality and gender. But calling themselves one family word helped them out. Doris Fish was one of the great drag queens in the 70s and 80s in Sydney. She moved to San Francisco. I moved there a few years later, and she was my drag mom. She helped me nav navigate the world of transgender in San Francisco, and she taught me tranny. And so I was a tranny. This was 1988. And F to M's were calling themselves trannies, and transvestites were calling themselves trannies. We'd all look at each other and smile, like, yeah, that's what we are. And then it got into the sex workers, started calling themselves tranny, and then the pornographers were writing tranny porn, and they were making tranny porn, it became a genre. And all I can figure is someone watched that tranny porn or availed themselves of a tranny sex worker and hated themselves so much for doing it that they turned it into a hate word. Right? But it was a word that meant family and still means family to a lot of people. What's the big deal between transgender and trannies? Transgenders don't want to be seen as drag queens or gender outlaws. And, and it's important not to. I, 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 don't, I think we've got to stand up for all points along our spectrum. But the fact is, any tipping point for mainstream culture inclusion has got to have been building up for a long, long time. It was trannies of color at Stonewall and it's trannies of all colors who've set up our tipping point. 
And I'm going to argue that years of RuPaul's Drag Race set the stage for Orange is the New Black and the subsequent Time Magazine cover story. Yeah. And I don't want to see, I don't want to see our trans, new trans movement invisibilizing drag queens the same way some retellings of Stonewall whitewash and invisibilize our true heroines. In the case of our impossible trans family here, no one has to like you especially or approve of the way you're doing things, but everybody does have to love family members and stand by them. Even if we only see each other once a year at a banquet or, or, or Christmas. And I know some of us are embarrassing to some of the others of us. I know that. I, I know. I, I got to tell you though, if I embarrass you, I promise you, you probably embarrass me. <laughs> theory of gender. Seriously, new. Right, right, Corey? Okay. It's a brand new theory of gender. Brandy, brandy new. I'm writing a new book about it. And uh, the working title of the new book is Trans, Just for the Fun of It. <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, we are such an impossible family. Trans identity is not singular. Trans identity is not dual. Trans identity isn't even a spectrum because a spectrum has two endpoints to it. No, 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 we're more than that. We are the dialectic I was talking about. Just look at how many trans identities are making themselves heard these days. We are queer and we are straight. As to those of us in relationships, some of us are monogamous, some of us are polyamorous, some of us are homo, hetero, some of us are shades of pansexual or asexual. We are butch women and we are sissy men. We are male to female and female to male. And we are agender, bigender, gender queer and non-binary. We are hermaphrodites, transsexuals, we are drag queens, drag kings and all tra drag fuck royalty. We are Mahu, Fahatha Fien, Hedra, Two Spirit, and dozens more indigenous trans identities. We are real men, and we are real women. We are trannies, we are chicks with dicks, we are she-males. We are professionals, homemakers, sex workers, porn stars, stay-at-home parents. We transition at all ages of life. Some of us transition with finality and some of us dance around with our transition. We all fit under trans. Now how to make that work? That's the dialectic and the binary thing. That was theory. Now let's look at a little bit of spirit. Last up, this is my new gender theory. And you can blame the Dalai Lama for it. <laughs> Last October, I went to a teaching with the Dalai Lama at the Beacon Theater in New York, about 3,000 people. And the title of his lecture was Profound Wisdom and Vast Compassion, the Essence of Eloquence. I write shit like gender outlaw. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I would love to write something like that. According to a Tibetan Buddhist definition of eloquence, eloquence is telling a truth in such a way that it eases suffering. That's eloquence. Right? Lovely, lovely, lovely thing. The more people whose suffering are eased by your truth telling, the more eloquent you've been. In order to parse this, Tibetan Buddhists have come up with roughly, they say there's roughly two kinds of genders. They're not trying to say there's only two, two, two kinds, but there's roughly two kinds of truth, sorry, truth. Um, there's definitive truth and there's arguable truth. Definitive truth, definitive truth. Everyone dies. 
can't, that, it, duh, right? Okay. Arguable truth. Um, Traffic in Houston sucks. <laughs> what was that? Traffic in Houston sucks. Traffic in Houston sucks. Arguably, okay, it's true, but you could argue that, and then you know if, you, if you're really into audiobooks and shit. <laughs> <laughs> so what I wanted to know right away, after hearing this lecture, was is there a definitive truth of gender? One that everyone would have to agree on, however grudgingly, and maybe this would ease off the wars we have with each other, with everybody insisting that they have the only truth about gender, or the best truth of gender. And I found the definitive truth of gender. I did. I fucking did. Yeah. It's very simple to say. I mean, there's, there's two ways of saying it. The, the, the simplest way and the academic way. The simplest way of saying the definitive truth of gender is this. Gender is relative. <laughs> academic. Gender is relative to context and point of view. Whatever else you say about gender is an arguable truth, including all my fucking books, which now could be great big fat lies, and that's theory for you. Um, really, that really. I coming. I'm no longer invested that people have to believe that gender is some kind of wild conflict. Chemo brain. Wild combination or or possibilities. Gender can be very very simple. It doesn't matter. And what you, what we what we can use this new way of looking at gender. The way I hope that you could use it is, okay, what's your truth of gender? How much suffering is eased by your truth of gender? How much suffering is caused by your insistence that people believe your truth of gender? And then we can start to really analyze, and then we can start to do some triage and really get down to who's getting hurt the most and based on what arguable truths. And we can unmask them for being exactly that, arguable truths. In closing, I see the hands of everybody who identifies as trans. Americans here who identify as trans. Okie dokie. <laughs> Keep your hand up if you have um, filled in the U.S. Trans Survey. Thank you for filling in the U.S. Trans Survey. Put your hand down. Um, those of you who have not yet finished the U.S. Trans Survey, uh, I think it's uh, USTransSurvey.org, there's two more days. The government is trying to find out who the fuck we are. <laughs> right? It's really, really cool because a lot of funding is going to come from this. And a lot of medical care and housing care is going to come from this. Anybody who is trans can fill in this survey. Please do. If you don't have a computer, find a friend who does. Go to a library. USTransSurvey.org All right. I want to do triage in our community. Who's most at risk? And... Mostly, I see is our kids. We we saw some wonderful things. I don't know if you're watching. I am Kate. Um, that show has been highlighting some wonderful work that's being done along the lines of gender <laughs> infinity with with parents who are really taking care of their trans kids. And but for every child who's loved as a sparkling unicorn, there are too many others who are abused and kicked to the curb as freaks and monsters. So we all need to chip in and make a space for all our queer and straight trans children. Our job as allies to trans kids and their families is to ask them what they need. 
or want, and to figure out how we can help them get that. And then there's the terrible, terrible epidemic, the murders of trans women of color. 18 so far this year. I'm going to read their names just because. Poppy Edwards, 20 years old. Lamia Beard, 30. Ty Underwood, age was not reported. Yasmin Vash Payne, 33. Taya Gabriel de Jesus, 36. Penny Proud, 22. Bree Golich, 22. Christina Gomez Reinwald, 46. London Chanel, 21. Mercedes Williamson, 17. India Clark, 25. Casey Haggard, 66. Sade Schuler, 22. Amber Monroe, 20. Candice Capri, 35. Alicia Walker, 20. Ashton O'Hara, 25. Tamara Domingo, 36. Our job as white allies to trans people of color and those who love them is to ask them what they need or want and figure out how we can best help them get that. This is where we get to show <laughs> This is where we get to show the world that we are a family, that we are a movement that transcends race and racism. We have our work cut out for us. I'm so proud to be part of this unity that we're here. It's an arguable truth, but I argue it. <laughs> I love you very much. It's an arguable truth. <laughs> but I argue it. I love you so much. I've got so much respect for you and gratitude for the work you're doing. I want to stay in touch with you. Please keep in touch with me. Uh, I'm Kate Bornstein on Twitter, Kate Bornstein on Instagram. And we can exchange contacts that way. Um, go, go, my darlings. Tell eloquent truths. Go be good family to each other. I love you. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. That was spectacular.